Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Christy Clark, Premier of the Province of British Columbia. Thanks very much. Thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome to, if you're not from here, beautiful Vancouver. This is our very first tech summit that we've ever uh, put on in uh, British Columbia. It's long past time that we did so, given the size of our tech industry here, uh, here in Vancouver, Kelowna, Victoria, small towns across the province where you know people are working, but um, so many people across the country would be surprised to see all the activity that's going on out there. And um, uh, I, unlike at a, at a cabinet meeting, I won't stop you if you get on Candy Crush during my speech. I'll try and make it short, though. Um, I, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, three things today quickly. Uh, first, I want to just talk about a fellow Burnaby boy, Don Matrick. Don and I did not go to the same high school. He went to um, Burnaby North, and I went to Burnaby South. And I always used to say that Burnaby South was the school that your parents sent you to if they didn't really care where you went to school. Uh, Burnaby, Burnaby North was different, um, and uh, they produced uh, Don Matrick, who's become such a tremendous success in the tech business. He, um, he and a high school friend started, uh, started their company, and they had their first big win uh, when they did a deal with Nintendo to do one of their games, as you might know. And um, he, uh, he uh, decided, after making that first deal, to go and buy a Ferrari um, in grade 11, and the, uh, and the uh, Ferrari dealer wouldn't even look at him. Um, and so he bought a Toyota and said, save himself a bunch of money. But um, he could have he afforded that Ferrari, and that's exactly what we want a young generation of people to be able to do, is, not, uh, is to have the money, um, the wealth that you create to go out there and create more jobs. Because he didn't get the car, but he did end up going to the bank to try and get a loan. And, uh, back then, um, 1981 or somewhere thereabouts, the bank laughed at him because they're, you know, well, you know, what, aren't you making tractors or fishing rods? We understand that. But doing um, video games with a company from Japan in the early 1980s all just seemed a little bit too far out for them. And um, he ended up doing okay with that project. Um, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles have uh, turned out to be uh, an enduring brand and product. But his experience, though, was something that still happens a lot, which is you have to be determined, and the truth of it is you have to be determined not to give up. You can't raise the white flag every time somebody says no in your business in particular, because in the tech sector, you got to believe in yourself. And so many people have stories about how there were times as you were growing and building that it felt like nobody believed in you. And the lesson I always take from Don's experience is that if you remain firm in your own self-belief, you can find success. And the second one is, is that uh, it, when you're innovating, because it's new and different, lots of people have no idea what you're talking about. And so sometimes uh, it's hard to find financing and it's hard to find believers until you prove what you know to be true actually works. And of course, another thing is that emerging technologies often do create a lot of resistance because they mean change. And change is often frightening for people. And we see that all over the world with companies like Uber and Lyft, with Airbnb, how much that's changing the market and how much resistance that's encountered from communities, um, from businesses, existing businesses, governments all around the world. And I'll tell you this, I know that people want choice. They want to live in a, in a world where they can choose things that work for their own lives, things that are convenient. They also want consumer protection. They want to know that their choices will be safe. But ultimately, as a government, we believe in a free market. And we believe in competition. And we believe in governments that listen to people. So in British Columbia, we're doing that. And so today I want to talk to you about three of those things, three, three things that I think are the most important for the tech industry in BC 
today because when Don and I were in school in Burnaby, um, they didn't teach computer skills, and he picked up his computer skills by getting his first computer skills um, by getting a summer job at Computerland, which I think was on Kingsway at the time in Burnaby. And this is a long way from that with 2,500 people here. We are uh, 2,800 people here. We are way more than sold out. And um, it just goes to prove that uh, things sure have changed a lot, and we need to make sure that we're keeping up with that change. So we are matching 180 potential investors with 100 CEOs and, uh, the fi and uh, 500 uh, people at TechFest to help you find ways to make sure that you're making connections and making deals while you're here. We also have hundreds of students here who are interested in getting to know all of you and talking to you about the things that you're getting into and how you've begun your businesses. We, are, uh, we have a coding camp for young people that are here. And um, thankfully for all of you, 35 years after Don Matrick first walked onto that car lot, they're still making Ferraris. So good luck to all of you. Um, the first thing that I wanted to talk to you about is kind of context. In British Columbia, we have about 120,000 people already working in the tech sector, and those are at wages that are about 60% higher than the industrial average. But we can't just assume that that's going to stay as is and we're going to continue to be successful in what we all know are very risky times around the world if you're watching what's happening in China, in Europe, and uh, certainly what's going on in, in the uh, political discussions in the United States. But at the moment, we have the strongest economy in the country. We created 50,000 jobs here last year. We remain AAA rated. We are the only province in Canada where that's true. And it's a really good starting point. But we have to think about, over this, this tech summit, how we're going to keep that going. And when, we talk, when I talk to you, I hear you need four things. One, you need ideas. And there, frankly, there's no shortage of ideas in British Columbia. We have some of the world's great universities. And they are producing incredible creative students who are producing um, those kinds of ideas that are going to be world leading. But the things that we don't have enough of, you've said, are money, access to investment and venture capital, talent, we need to deepen the local talent pool, and make and new markets, access to more customers for emerging products. So first, on the capital side, you know we announced a $100 million tech venture capital fund for the first time uh, in, in many years in British Columbia. We are going to be able to refill that venture capital pool to make it available for young, beginning companies that are need to find their way, that need to raise a little money. And in the months ahead, you'll get more details about exactly how it's going to work. We're still in the process of uh, seeking and negotiating with our, our successful private sector fund manager. We do know that government doesn't do the best job when we're choosing uh, winners and, and losers out there, when we're making investments uh, in the private sector. So we want to make sure this is done by a private sector fund manager. And you add that $100 million tech fund to the lowest combined uh, corporate taxes in the G7, and just as an example, in British Columbia, our combined corporate tax rate is 26%. In California, it's north of 40%. We have income tax credits up to $33 million every year for venture capital firms. Uh, we have tax credits for digital animation and visual effects, interactive digital media, and we have the lowest personal income taxes in most brackets of anywhere in the country. So that's what we're building on when it comes to the finance side of the business. The second thing you've told us is you need more talent. And we know that that's crucial for your success. Tech companies will locate in places where they can find the people that will be capable of doing the work. So we need to start that in our schools. So over the next three years, every kindergarten to grade 12 student will have every one of them. Will have, kindergarten to grade 12 will have the opportunity to learn the basics of coding and all of those fundamental tech skills. Now, that's going to start in September. And it is my goal to make sure that it doesn't just become an opportunity for every child to take part in, that we ultimately make it mandatory for every child from kindergarten to grade 12 to learn what coding is and how it works.
In post-secondary, we've got to continue to focus on that. We're moving $450 million for, uh, to, uh, for, in -demand, for training, specifically into tech, for in-demand jobs. We're updating our post-secondary curriculum with a new emphasis on technology, math, sciences, and creativity. We'll have new standards, we will have redesigned programs, and we um, you know, already, our universities, have about 80% co-op programs in their, in their tech-related um, curriculum. In order to have any new program in tech approved in British Columbia, 100% of your students must be uh, able to go into a co-op program, and our goal is to make that true for all of the existing programs that are out there today. We're investing four and a half million dollars toward a technology stream for tuition training upgrading for people who are already in the workforce but want to move in to tech. Those, the applications for that program are open right now. But I know you want to make sure that British Columbians are first in line for jobs. That's what I want to do too. It's way easier to make sure that you're deploying local talent than it is finding talent somewhere else. But I also know that for many highly specialized jobs in tech, you need to look outside of British Columbia, outside of Canada, in order to find those workers. And I also know that when you do, for every one of them, something like five jobs get created at least here in BC. So we're working with this new federal government to maximize our, our, the number of people that we are able to bring in from other countries through immigration to support the tech sector. Now, you know our provincial nominee program. If you don't, you will. And um, I hope you won't find it as frustrating as those who do. It's our only direct tool that we have um, to be able to select immigrants specifically for specific jobs. Our quota that's given to us by the federal government is about 5,500 a year. We actually uh, uh, exceeded that last year and brought in 5,800. And it's our goal to make sure that we focus as many of those on the tech sector as we possibly can. Um, we've introduced a new online application system to try and make it a little bit easier for you because when you're working every day to try and build your business and your head down, you are not thinking about how you can wade your way through endless forms and requirements so that the federal government will allow you to be able to grow your business. So next week you will also see the launch of a new PNP skills immigration registration process that will be on our Welcome BC website. That's going to cut wait times even further and it's going to assure that you, our nominations, the ones that we send to the federal government for sign off, are the ones that meet your needs as precisely as we possibly can. Because I know that your demand for talent is urgent especially some of that highly specialized talent that you can't find here. So if you need help bringing immigrants into the country for specific jobs to support you in growing your business, I want you to call us. We have specific staff dedicated to helping you work through step-by-step step the government process, which frankly you never ever want to become an expert in if you can help it. We have someone who can do that for you, and I want to put the number up here on the screen. Now last is markets. Obviously, uh, capital and talent won't mean very much if you don't have anywhere to sell your product. And it occurs to me that in core government, we spend about $45 billion a year in British Columbia. And if you add in all of the other areas of government, um, it's a very big number. We procure a lot of product. And we have over the years, because government tends to be risk averse, got into the habit of procuring product from people with whom we already do business. And that means it makes it really difficult for emerging companies with new and innovative products to find their way in to be able to do business with their own government. We intend to change that. So we've already made selling to government is much more simple. We used to have something like a 20 or 30 page RFP form. We've, we've reduced that down to two. And we are also creating now a developer's exchange. This is going to make it radically faster to be able to respond to an RPA, a, a, a request for proposals. So that'll help us determine with you collaboratively what government needs to do to solve our problems. 
Because in many cases, the things that government do, do could, be, uh, could be sped up significantly. We could find tremendous efficiencies. But nobody's ever even really thought about it. You are. We need to make uh, to create a forum where we will connect with BC's tech sector more frequently and more intimately to make sure that you are helping us come up with new ideas to solve problems we don't even know we have. So we're starting this week 250 one-on-one -on -one meetings with government officials. BC Assessment is already working with the tech sector to think about how we can commercialize better and rationalize our real estate data. Queen's Printer is working with the tech sector now to think about how we can commercialize better our legal data. You think about all of the opportunities for commercialization of data in British Columbia to create better access for citizens, but also create more wealth for the province. I don't think we've even gotten halfway there. So last, um, I want to just close with this because tech makes, I mean, I understand, as all of you do, the tremendous difference that tech makes. I was down at the Cancer Agency last week announcing some more money to support their oncogenomics program and the incredible work that they're doing in um, hopefully coming up with personalized cure, a personalized cure for every form of cancer if they're successful, right here in British Columbia. The work that they're doing is important in itself. All of the work that will spin off from that is also going to be an important generator of jobs across the province. And we need to support that cutting edge work. So when I talked about universities at the beginning and the creation ideas, it's doing things like supporting, uh, adding $20 million to the planned upgrade for the Life Sciences Undergraduate Teaching Center at UBC, making sure that the facilities that we have are absolutely world class and up to snuff. That, those are the kinds of roles that government can play in helping get, to, get you to the next level. Supporting you in trade missions, making sure that our trade representatives know who you are and are helping you find customers in the countries where we're represented all over, uh, over, overseas. But it is abundantly clear to me that we are not alone in this. Um, your industry here in our province is backed by an incredible passion that you won't find in many other tech hubs anywhere around the world. Marty Reed and Jonathan Roan over at Evoc, they announced that they're going to access the Clean, uh, Clean Oil and Gas Innovation Fund, a $100 million fund to invest in making sure that we produce the cleanest oil and gas anywhere in the world right here in British Columbia. Zymeworks, Keros Therapeutics, they embarked on a new partnership announced $61.5 million for cancer treatment research. Saltworks, desalination, the work that they're doing in taking previously unusable wastewater byproduct and turning it into drinkable water. Those are just some of the ideas in British Columbia that are being commercialized and that are turning into real money for people who work here and live here. And that's just the past seven days. Those are the companies uh, that want to do business here. They want to set down roots here. And we want you to do that. We will do what we, uh, we will do what we need to to make sure that our tech sector continues to grow. This is an absolutely vital part of British Columbia's future. We have a diverse economy, but it will not be diverse without the tech sector. A sector that in and of itself produces jobs but a sector that also allows every other part of our economy, from resources, agriculture, oil and gas, forestry, all of the other sectors, to be more efficient and to be world leading. So thank you for your confidence in British Columbia. We are delighted you're here. Our challenge as a government is to do everything that we can to make sure that rather than getting in your way, we do everything that we can to make sure that you grow. And not just to make sure that you grow, but that once you grow, that you stay. Welcome to British Columbia. I hope that this is the beginning of a very long, productive, and profitable relationship for all of us. Thank you very much.